Amy Boucher is on a mission to bring the psychology of motivational design to healthcare. She's currently the Chief Behavioral Officer at Lirio and the author of Engaged, Design for Behavior Change. I recently got a chance to sit down with Amy and find out how she uses nudges, rewards, and motivational design to encourage healthy behavior. Be sure to listen to the end to hear Amy's insightful take on the role of crypto in healthcare. When I've presented on behavioral design, I sometimes use this stock photo that's like a pair of colored sunglasses coming down over the image, because I think behavioral designers do a lot of the same activities that other designers do, but they do them through the lens of behavior science, frameworks, theories, approaches. So for example, if I were to produce a design deliverable, it would probably be written. Um, whether that's in terms of content for a product or requirements, because that's my skill set. But I've worked with behavioral designers who are visual artists who can create the actual wireframe and then the interaction design for an app that's designed to change behavior. What we have in common is that as we approach the research and the development of these things, we're pointing back to specific theories or frameworks about how human behavior is influenced and determined. It's really about identifying the behaviors that we want people to do and then starting to identify the barriers that stop people from performing those behaviors, the facilitators that help them to do it, and then figure out how can we make our design either overcome those barriers or amplify the facilitators so that the end result is we're making this behavior easier for people to do. When I think about healthcare, I think that there are some areas where we really do need to tap into motivation. And I think of that in terms of people's identity. What type of person do you believe you are? What are your core values? What are the things that you have to do behaviorally to feel consistent and good about who you are? And then what are your personal goals, like your life, your big G goals that these smaller behaviors moment to moment could help you live into? And then there are the things where nudges are appropriate. So if it's making an appointment, just pick up the phone and make the appointment and a nudge can get somebody to do that sort of quick episodic behavior. But that's in contrast to something like if you need to adapt, adopt a special diet for a medical condition, you are making hundreds of decisions every single day around what that means behaviorally. And there's no way as a designer that I can be there moment to moment nudging you for every single one of those decisions. I need you to have something within yourself that will provide the guidepost in those moments. And perhaps as a designer, there are other key opportunities to check in with a nudge. Maybe it's something where at the grocery store, we can use nudges to help put better things in your cart. But again, you're going to go home and I'm not going to be there to nudge every bite you put in your mouth. So I see the two approaches needing to work together when we're talking about these larger types of behavior changes that span long periods of time. I used to be a total naysayer on external rewards and you know, self-determination theory would predict that you're going to get pretty for, poor follow through, at least over time, with a reward-based intervention. There's also some evidence that being rewarded in the short term does not necessarily burn out your long term motivation. And that's in contrast to some um, older research. And so one of the things that I think about is, are there behaviors where we can reward somebody and it won't matter as much? And I tend to think that things that are episodic are good candidates for re rewards. So if we're doing a health risk assessment, one of those surveys that has 100 questions about everything health related. I feel okay rewarding somebody financially for that because they probably have to do it at most once a year. Even things like having a mammogram or a colonoscopy that happen at most once a year. I might put a financial reward around something like going to your ophthalmologist once a year, but I would not want to do that for something like checking your blood sugar, which needs to happen several times a day. That's where I'd really want to try to tap into that motivation or those bigger G goals again. My favorite form of what I'll call user experience research, and the one that I've used most often, is the one-on-one -on -one interview. I thought were a great opportunity to really develop rapport with people and understand in their own words how they're experiencing a particular behavior, whether they're doing well at it or poorly at it. And I will say, I think there's value in talking to people who are in both of those buckets. So people who've already figured out how to do something well and people who are struggling with it and understanding what some of the differences in their situations might be. And one of, one of the things I particularly love about the one-on-one -on -one interview is that 
you get such emotionally rich data. You get to see people's facial expressions, hear their tone of voice, the specific words that they use to talk about their experience. There's a lot to unpack in the implicit data that you're receiving there that is missing from something like a survey, which has its place in research for sure. But especially when I'm just starting out with a product design, I really want to understand that rich level of experience from the people who will ultimately be its users. We would go into a, a customer environment and really start fresh in terms of building a journey map, doing the groundwork, the research to understand what the customer experience or the patient experience was, and then sitting with that data to figure out from a visual perspective, how do we illustrate this journey? And we frequently found that linear was not an appropriate shape for a patient or a healthcare related journey. So there were often either loops like a roller coaster. Or we had a couple that were fully circular, but oftentimes you find with healthcare, it's very natural to have relapse states or plateaus. If you think about something like weight loss, where you may make really good progress for a while and then it slows down or even reverts, just really getting flexible and thinking about a journey as a non-linear entity and being comfortable with the idea that people may move back and forth along that. And I think this relates to game design as well. Um, a phrase that I'm hearing a lot is next best action. So if a person accomplishes something or reaches a milestone, what is the next best action? And one of the things that game designers do really well that behavioral designers are just starting to get better at is making that call to action part of the feedback so that you have that continuous progression over time. I think back to some earlier examples and it just felt like the communication, the engagement with a patient was very episode bound. It was like, okay, you did the appointment, we'll give you feedback. Now we won't talk to you again for another year. But there's an opportunity to have more of this ongoing conversation and keep giving people these small calls to action that keep them walking along the journey to go back to that metaphor. I use the phrase mental models a lot, but in a different way. So it's part of what we call automatic motivation. And it basically is, does a person have an idea that this is a behavior that's appropriate for them, that it will help them achieve their goals? What is their mental model around the behavior? I can remember when I was at J&J &J and we were talking about a new product idea that never came to be. The working name for it was Pocket Friend. And just built into that name was this assumption that that would be people's mental model of it. But in fact, what Pocket Friend was designed to do probably didn't feel very friendly because it was really about keeping people on track with all of these health behaviors and not necessarily in a buddy sort of way. The other place where I've encountered what you talked about with mental models a lot is actually around games and gamification. And I think this is something that's gotten better, but maybe about seven to 10 years ago, I frequently encountered external organizations who would say, can you gamify this experience? And upon talking to them, it became clear that they didn't understand that gamify was the addition of gaming elements to an experience. And instead, they were really looking for something that was game-like. And that is not appropriate for a lot of healthcare type applications. People who are, are coming in to manage a very serious health condition are not looking for like a Mario Brothers-esque experience around that. So that was something that felt really frustrating for a while. I actually had a bunch of documents and things that I would use in these situations about like, here's gamification and here's games and here's why we do this and not that. Like, why do you want a leaderboard for your blood pressure management app? Is that really a good idea? That seems to have faded, fortunately. We actually did a research study when I was with J&J. &J. It was for a client. It was some kind of medication tracking an online interface for them to track their medication. And one of our respondents said, if I could remember to go online and track, I'd remember to take the medication. And for me, that was a changing moment for me to hear that. Where I think there might be promise is in thinking about how you correlate data to an individual or to a group of individuals. So one of the things that has been a systemic problem in healthcare is how fragmented the data is. It's something I, I think I've run into at every job I've had in multiple different ways. It's really difficult to look at an individual and truly understand what their complete health picture looks like. And so I see in the blockchain technology potential to identify the data that belongs to a person across contexts and organizations so that we can more effectively help them with whatever challenges they're facing. Even something like COVID-19 vaccination, one of the things that we're running into is that people can get that vaccine from many different types of organizations. And for most states in the United States, there isn't a really good, accessible, centralized vaccination database. So if we're trying to reach out to people and encourage them to get that vaccination or to understand if they've already had it, it's a really difficult data problem. So that, that's where I see there potentially being some promise for this other technology.
I would love to have my team train in game design because I see how neatly it will plug right back into our work and help make our product more compelling. The motivational dynamics underlying both have so much in common. The thing we talk about a lot too is we're not really just competing against our competitors. People aren't sitting down and going, am I using this weight loss app or this weight loss app or this one? They're saying, do I open up TikTok or the weight loss app? So we really do need to think about being engaging in a way that, you know, is, is non-traditional for healthcare. Wasn't that great? Smart behavioral design has so much potential to make healthcare more effective and engaging. If you want more, be sure to check out Amy's book. There's a link in the description. And if you want to level up your product design skills and apply game thinking to your project, check out our programs. It's at gamethinking.io slash programs. Let's get smarter together. I'll see you next week.